Redhead Shanks is the emperor of the underworld. But just exactly what is the underworld? Well, we spent the vast majority of One Piece exploring the surface, which as we now know is but a fraction of the true world available. And simultaneously, we've spent an infinitesimally low time exploring Shanks, and this is no coincidence because his domain lies below. And it explains how he can maintain an empire, teleport all around the planet, and maintain his status with a mere 10 man and two monkey crew. All of this time, Time, we've been looking up here, but we should have been looking down there because that's what Shanks has been doing. This video was inspired by Parvision's greatest Shanks theory ever, which is an older video that has only appreciated over time. And a lot of what gets said in it is really starting to pay off with modern revelations. So there will be a link in the description and guys, he's almost at 100,000 subscribers. So feel free to assist his journey to the fun number and maybe it'll kick him in the butt to make more videos. Let's talk about the underworld. The term underworld is very specific in One Piece, generally referring to a illegal and or world government sanctioned trade of weapons, slaves, and all sorts of other, you know, not, not so great things. However, the underworld in One Piece is much more literal than the underworld of real life, because the underworld is also the name of a lower sector of ocean where the world government have no jurisdiction and operate on a completely different network of currents than surface travel. And here's the connective tissue between the two underworlds. At Big Mom's tea party, we were introduced to the underworld emperors, and the emperor I'm most interested in is Umit, a sentence that no one has said ever, but his epithet is Shipping King Deep Sea Currents Umi. The underworld isn't just a metaphorical term for nefarious illegal activities. No, it is in fact a literal place that facilitates said activities. And it ties quite deeply into everything we currently know about one redhead Shanks. In the One Piece world, if you're traveling by ship, you have two choices to make your way around the planet. The first is to travel via the surface currents, which are present in the upper layer of sea. And that's what we see every time we're on open water. However, there is a second far less known method, which is to take the deep current, which flows entirely differently on the lower layer of ocean and opens up a whole new world of options for travel. Think of the surface current as an above ground highway and the deep current as a tunnel, which is particularly apt because roads and tunnels are generally connected together at certain points, just as the surface currents and deep currents are connected. As demonstrated by Frankie's twisty, windy dragon metaphor, those currents are always connected somewhere. They don't just branch off and combine from west to east. They can go up and down, surfacing and submerging like a giant dragon. The sea currents flow all around the world uninterrupted. Uninterrupted is an important word. We'll get to that later. But this example was given to us in relation to getting to Fishman Island. Because if you understand the current network, then you can access a form of fast travel. So instead of going straight down to the sea floor, what the Straw Hats did was they went down and da da da. <laughs> that makes sense, right? <laughs> However, choosing to utilize the deep current is very dangerous. Dangerous. Because not only can things get way out of control and smash you to pieces against colossal continent remnants, but they can also dump you into undersea volcanoes, and it can even lead you into a fate far, far worse, as described by Brook. I heard that the deep current flows very slowly near the ocean floor. If it were to carry you all the way to the bottom, you wouldn't see the light of day again for 2,000 years. That's right. There are countless legends surrounding these unknown currents too. Monsters, curses, lost souls. So the further you ride the current down, the slower travel become. And it probably reaches a point where it feels like you're not moving at all. And then it remains like that for who knows how many hundreds or even thousands of years. It's even been speculated that Laugh Tail is on the sea floor and only accessible by riding the deep current to completion, which as Brooks stated, could take thousands of years. And that's why very few people end up getting to Laugh Tail without a little help from some mystery cubes that provide a handy road to the island. All of which is to say that the world government have no no dominion over the deep currents at all. Their territory is very much the upper layer surface currents. And apart from the new world, every area of the surface is under world government domain. Pirates and other nefarious ne'er-do-wells cannot conduct business effectively via the surface currents because they're too heavily policed, which is where deep sea current Umit comes in to make his fortune by taking advantages of shortcuts that the world government can't or don't want to access. And we know this because the world government uses Umit services as we saw in Bartholomew Kuma's flashback. During the construction of Vegapunk's lab on Egghead Island, it was Umit who was charged with transporting all the materials safely. Which, for such a secretive and very important lab, you would think the world government might want to handle that sort of thing themselves? And I imagine they would have if they could. But the deep current is too far beyond their influence, so they need to rely on the underworld. It's also the only way that pirates, assorted merchants, and even possibly revolutionaries are able to combat the world government's own version of fast travel on the surface. Which is that the world government are in control of very specific global areas, such as 
the Tardai Current, or Vegapunk Sea Stone ship technology that allows the world government to sail through the Calm Belt without being targeted by the Sea Kings, meaning that they can skip over various points of sea and take all sorts of fun shortcuts. On the surface, the world government have every advantage and cannot be beaten, but under the surface, they can be easily outmaneuvered. So let's bring our boy Shanks back into this. Shanks is a man of mystery, appearing very sparsely in One Piece, but not for story reasons, mind you. No, 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 no. It's because Shanks is almost always far too busy, enjoying the innovative award-winning flavor of Fume, the sponsor of this video, and manufacturer of these magnificent flavored air devices. Behold, a thing. This thing is a Fume, and inside of it goes another thing. A flavored core involving no electronics, no vapor, no harmful chemicals, and in fact, Fume's cores are closer to a herbal tea. There is nothing addictive whatsoever, and many flavors are available. You've got black, you've got white, you've got green, you've got black again. But primarily the supreme flavor, orange vanilla. Love orange vanilla. Oh, and the fumes also do this. Absurdly satisfying. And very low maintenance because fume are also completely battery free. There's no need to charge it except in court for the crime of being too good of an all natural flavored air experience or something like that. What I'm trying to say is that fume is great and I genuinely enjoy them. As do the over 300,000 other customers that fume have served to date. And for a limited time, you can use my code GRANDLINE REVIEW to get your free fume base when you order the journey pack. It's the all new magnetic stand for your fume device. So I actually didn't get one of these until very recently. I, like the uncultured swine I am, thought it was unnecessary. But now, mate, I don't know what I would do without a funky magnet on my desk to prop up my fidgeting device. So head to tryfume.com, that's tryfum.com, and use code GRANDLINEREVIEW or scan the QR code on screen to get your free Fume base when you order your journey pack today. And thank you so much to Fume, because their sponsorship allows us to bring you the best fictional pirate content possible as often as possible. So try them out, but for now it's back to you. Me. This actually presents the answer to one of the most enduring mysteries surrounding him being the Marineford situation. A very confusing point in One Piece history, where Shanks both came into conflict with Kaido in the New World and arrived to stop the Paramount War in Paradise on the very same day, within hours of one another. So the Marines, they keep very strict eyes on those four emperors. They know every move they make, to the point where if Shanks was to so much as defecate at a different angle on the toilet, then the fleet admiral would be immediately summoned into an emergency meeting. So how did Shanks manage to vanish completely off the radar in the New World and show up uninvited to the Paramount War on the other side of the red line? In order to explain this, we've traditionally had to resort to some very insane ideas. For example, before it was revealed that Shanks was not a Devil Fruit user, the primary theory was a time travel fruit or a time stop fruit. Very popular. But let's go back to what Frankie said. The sea currents flow all around the world uninterrupted, which implies that it is in fact possible to travel anywhere from anywhere, all in one go without needing to worry about obscurities like the red line or needing to go through bottlenecks like the Fishman Island Passage. There are almost certainly other pathways for travel throughout the world that are either not known or not well known. But even then, it's probably not possible for Shanks to maneuver this fast in the deep current alone. However, there is one very important thing that I've neglected to mention. Shame, shame on me. But that one thing is the White Strom, a phenomenon described by Robin as an enormous white whirlpool that appears without warning near the sea floor, like a live writhing dragon. Once a ship is caught in the stream, it turns up days later, an unfathomable distance away and entirely empty. So the White Strom is like a naturally occurring version of Bartholomew Kuma's teleportation. It can fast travel anywhere on the planet if you know how to use it correctly, and if you can survive it. It's kind of like taking the knock up stream as a method of fast travel to Sky Islands. An incredibly dangerous but highly rewarding proposition if it pays off. And Mr. Parvision has good reason to believe that Shanks is not only a master of the deep sea currents, but also an overlord of the White Strom. So with that in mind, here is how I would suggest the Marineford situation may have played out. Kaido set sail to Marineford because he's a bit of a troublemaker, but in order to get there in time from the New World, he needs to take the deep current. Which, by the way, is also more than likely how Whitebeard arrived at Marineford as well. Remember when the Moby Dick popped up from underwater and the Marines were all like, whoa, where did that come from? Because they had zero intel on where the Whitebeard pirates were. Well, that's because they were almost certainly traveling via the deep current. So this Kaido guy, right, he tries to follow and take the deep current as well, but is then intercepted by Shanks. And this is a big problem for Kaido because 
because the vast majority of his crew are devil fruit users, as is he, and an underwater conflict puts him at a colossal disadvantage. And as a side note, pretty convenient that Shanks doesn't have any devil fruit users on his crew, isn't it? Mm. It's almost as if his activities are deliberately designed to take advantage of the underwater based activities. But we'll get back to that in a bit as well. From here, Kaido either realizes that he's in a bad spot and retreats, or more likely, he insists on fighting, at which point Shanks could use his knowledge of the deep current to knock Kaido off course, or even better, into a white strom that would take him so far away that he has no chance of getting to Marineford in time. After which point, Shanks could then hitch a ride on a white strom himself to Marineford in order to get there as quickly as he did. And at this point in real time, I think this is the most reasonable explanation for how Shanks traveled so fast. But it's not just this one case, you see, this Shanks, he, he's a tricky fellow and has a bit of a history of teleportation. In fact, all the way back in chapter 433, we saw a very similar situation where an emergency report was given to the five elders that Shanks had quote, broken through their lines and made contact with the Emperor Whitebeard. And it's very unlikely that he did so by force because when the Red Force rocks up, it is in pristine condition. There isn't a single sign of combat, which I should say is exactly the same as when he showed up at Marineford as well. Despite coming into contact with Kaido, there was no indication of conflict whatsoever. And remember that the world government sees the meeting of two emperors as an apocalyptic level event. They would do everything in their power to prevent this because whether they form an alliance or start a war with one another, they have the power to completely destabilize the planet. So I think it's incredibly likely that Shanks, again, use the deep sea current and or the white strong in order to take the Marines by surprise and have his meeting with Whitebeard. But this also explains a much more recent Shanks development, which is the introduction of his grand fleet, who I love because they're all portrayed as dollar store pirates who are pretty much incapable of anything. In the manga, Eustace Kidd is even confused and refers to them as a bunch of nobodies, which rude, that's not how you would refer to the extended forces of any other emperor, especially ones like Big Mom and Kaido, who have walking meat empires numbering in the tens of thousands because they need those small armies to retain control and security over their vast empires. Now, Shanks, he also has a vast empire, but a useless grand fleet who can't retain control over that vast empire. So they're not ruled in the same way. So how does Shanks protect those territories? His grand fleet is useless. So the power behind the Red Hair Empire comes down to the 12 members of the Red Hair Pirates, two of which are monkeys of questionable usefulness. So it's up to 10 humans to protect what takes other emperors tens of thousands. And I think the only solution to this is that Shanks has a travel advantage. Shanks and the Red Hair Pirates are able to protect their territories because they can travel faster than any other emperor. Be that through the deep current, the White Strom, or maybe even another mechanism that we're not aware of yet. Because every emperor has their own specialty within the new world, a certain monopoly that makes them very difficult to topple. With Big Mom, it's tempting to say that food was her specialty, and sure, it was, but she was also portrayed as the emperor of information. Her network far surpassed any other that we know of, and it was reflected in her contacts as she invited the entire underworld to her tea party. Meanwhile, for Kaido, his specialty was weapons. He was the one funding and developing much of the world's most horrible innovations in weaponry to plunge the world into a big old war. And with Shanks, I would suggest that his specialty is travel and transportation. Because he has effective teleportation, it makes him impossible to predict. And it also gives him the ability to respond quicker than anyone else. Because Shanks can kind of be everywhere at once. And to bring this back to his crew, I think it makes a lot of sense for them to be exclusively non-Devil Fruit users if there was a high focus on the deep current and general underwater activities. As emperors of the sea often recruit purely for their own personal empire goals. Big Mom, pretty infamous with stacking her crew with food Devil Fruit users. And then Kaido obviously has his own agenda with the raw power of animals. So Shanks, he's really no different. He focuses on underwater. So you know what? No fruit users, probably not a good idea. And really the emperors weren't just deadlocked by brute force, but also their specialties. You can't start a war with Kaido because he's got superior weapons. You also can't start a war with Big Mom because she has superior information and her network can outplay you. They know what you're going to do before you do it. But also, my God, you can't start a war with Shanks because he can outmaneuver you in every way. And I'd also propose that's why the world government are so afraid of an alliance between emperors. Again, not just as a threat of raw power, but also as a combination of specialties that severely tip logistics in their favor. The sort of logistics that the world government cannot compete with, even with their dominion of the surface current. But if true, how did Shanks acquire this specialty? Well, as many things do these days, it all comes back to the Roger Pirates. After confirming that the world has been flooded, I've been saying this a lot and I will continue to be saying it again, but the Roger Pirates have a huge focus on underwater activity. Whether that be Rayleigh becoming a professional ship coach 
Dakota or Crocus living in a whale. And I don't believe that's a coincidence. They know the truth of the world and they understand just how powerful the unknown depths are. And even though Shanks himself didn't go to Laugh Tale, I would be shocked if he didn't at least have some sense of the importance of the ocean as well, and therefore set out to master and conquer the deep sea, perhaps in order to block others from doing the same and discovering the assorted secrets whilst waiting for Joy Boy's return. He might even have learned this from Roger, because remember, Roger didn't even have a grand fleet, not even a useless one, and somehow the Roger pirates were able to travel around the world without any issues. And this takes me back to Roger's final voyage, the one where he zipped all around the globe to find them poneglyphs, and in the space of one year, he went on to visit every important location in the world. We saw Roger go to Skypea in Paradise, Fishman Island at the bottom of the Red Line, Wanu in the New World, even Tequila Wolf in East Blue. This and so much more all happened in the space of a year. And that just shouldn't be possible. You shouldn't be able to just dart all around the world aimlessly like this and have it work, especially with Roger's notoriety and the amount of people chasing him, both pirates and Marines. So my only conclusion at this point is that his crew must have been making use of the deep current and perhaps even the white strong in order to facilitate their poneglyph cleanup mission, which is how Shanks may have become such a master of this form of travel because he's been doing it since he was a kid. And there's even modern day evidence that remaining Roger pirates could still be doing the same. Like when Rayleigh's ship sank and he had to swim all the way to Amazon Lily, which is an insane distance away. So maybe Rayleigh caught a white strum to the calm belt instead of swimming all the way there through the surface. I think that one that one's a bit of a leap. Rayleigh is the kind of boss who would just swim all the way there. Although if another more convenient form of travel was known to him, then eh, why not? The greater point is that the underworld of One Piece remains terrifyingly unexplored and it holds powerful features and treasures for those willing to take that risk. At the moment, I believe that Shanks is the only one who has even begun to do such a thing. And as hinted by Brooke's 2000 year journey legend, the deep sea current may very well be the key to finding Laugh Tale itself. So when Shanks says that it's time to go and claim the One Piece, don't get too excited because it could still be a very, very long journey ahead.